Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you. <laughs> if you're wondering why it's dark in here, we um, are having some issues with the overhead lights, and since we don't have hymnals, um, we need to be able to see the projector. So this is how it will be, hopefully, only this week. Try to get it figured out by next week. And then during the preaching, we'll have the overhead lights on. But it's good to see your faces, and we want to do things in the light as God is in the light. So this is not going to be the new norm. Don't worry. For those online, welcome to River's Edge. It's great to have you with us today and any guests or visitors with us. Um, we always love to remind ourselves and one another why we gather, so let's do that. We gather to glorify God, proclaim his gospel, grow in Christ, serve his church, and devote ourselves to one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119 calls us to worship the Lord today. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Let us consider those words now with a moment of silent anticipation before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to gather together to declare your praises, to hear and learn your word so that it would pour forth out of us. Lord, as the psalmist said twice, may we delight in your word. May we delight in your truth. May we delight in you and in your body, the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would now make a sweet sound to your ear and that we would worship you in all that we do as we're gathered here in spirit and truth. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Come down, Almighty King. Help us thy name to sing. Help us to praise. Father, our glorious, you're all victorious. Come and reign over us, ancient days. 
God through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so as we've gone through the Heidelberg Catechism, taking each phrase of the Apostles' Creed at a time and what it means for us, we've, we've come to the end of that. And so our question today asks us, what good does this do for us? And so that's why I wanted us to, to say the Creed and be reminded of, of what it says before we ask this. So I will read question 59 and have you respond with the answer. What, does, what good does it do you to believe all this? In Christ, I am righteous before God and heir to life everlasting. Amen. I would ask the ushers forward at this time. We will prepare to worship the Lord through our giving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an amazing truth it is that we are righteous before you because of Christ, that we are co-heirs to life everlasting because of what he has accomplished. Lord, help us to believe this more today. Help our unbelief, and Lord, may we tell others this truth. And as we give now, Lord, may we do generously, not under compulsion, but that we would be cheerful givers as your kingdom is furthered on this earth, that we could be a part of that, your gospel going forth. But may we also declare it with our lips to those around us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
It's a newer song for us this morning. And as we sing it, consider the mystery that we will look at in the word today of Christ, his humanity and his divinity. And this song helps us to do that. Come be the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, in reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to get these other lights on, so just prepare your eyes for a, a changeover. 
<clears throat> Good morning. Wow, there's a lot of you here. Praise God. I'm going to put a cough drop in my mouth because I, I think I'm probably going to cough. At Let's welcome this. Pastor John back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. What a brutal virus this is, isn't it? Uh, but I'm so thankful. Oh, look at you, Mike. Look at Mike Romaine. Look at him. <laughs> Man, you... Oh, you're welcome. We'll give him a big hand. We love you so much. Brother, we love you. Man, it was touch and go, and you had me worried a couple of times, and uh, man, you fought like a champ. Really did. Three months. Brutal. But here you are. Hey, would you all turn with me, uh, before I start my sermon, something, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and then you can uh, turn with me to Hebrews. It's been a while since I've been with you, so hey, I love you, and I'm just so glad to be with you, and just, I was in tears, Jake, Jake, you know, my kids have run that thing. But you do the best job of anybody's ever done it here. I'm telling you what, you're just right on top of it. And it matters, because when we don't have the lyrics, we can't sing. And you did just a great job this morning. I'm going to talk about you today. All right. Look at chapter 13. It's speaking of love and how love never ends. Um, And then in verse 10 or excuse me, verse 11, it says this. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now, we need faith as a child. The Bible teaches us that. Jesus teaches it. But we don't remain children in the faith, my friends. If you're not growing with me, I'll tell you what. As a pastor... So much, God's word has changed me. And it's been my prayer these three weeks here that I've been down that you would grow in the riches of God's word. This is how we grow. We grow up. We don't, well, keep it simple, stupid. You know, this is sort of the Huron County attitude. That's not who we are in this church. We are are growing amen we are growing and you see that jesus in our text today is growing let's say that we are growing now turn with me to hebrews 6 chapter 6 i just want you to see that what what i'm saying here is so important to us we hunger and thirst for the word of god Chapter 6, let us leave. That means depart, separate ourselves. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Let's, Let's leave the baby stuff and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Let's, let's move on. Okay. You don't just stay there. If you have true faith in Jesus Christ, the fruit will follow, and you will grow. And we do this by immersing ourselves in the word of God, and you can understand it. You guys are smart. All right, so that's just a little introductory comment for today. But would you turn with me to our text? We're going to go back now to chapter 2, verse 39. We're going to look at the section 39 through 52, and I have a question 
for the title of our message. Why must Jesus be truly God and truly man? Why is this a big deal? Keep it simple, stupid. I don't want to know those, those difficult concepts. Well, no, that's not who we are. You're capable of this. And, you know, it would do you no good if you're going to hell for me up here to tell you you're going to heaven. You would want me to teach you the truth about God's word, wouldn't you? Amen. Are you with me? All right. I love you deeply, and I want to tell you the truth. So let's go to the truth. Uh, Luke promised, if you look at chapter 1, verse 3, he promised us an orderly account. So we'd have certainty, uh, verse 4, in chapter 1, so that we'd have certainty concerning the things we've been taught. Are you looking at your Bibles? Because we're going to look at the Bible today. <clears throat> Luke's gospel is about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Do we know who Jesus Christ is? Do we worship the Jesus Christ of the Bible? Or do we worship the Jesus Christ of K-Love Radio? Which do we worship? the popular Jesus Christ, or the Jesus Christ strictly of the Bible. Well, we got most of it right, you know. No, no we, want to be, we want to be careful to worship Jesus of the Bible. Uh, what did happen to the children of Israel when they just thought, ah, that'd be good enough. We're going to worship this way with the golden calf, and it's the way they did it in Egypt. And, you know, Moses, he's taking too much time up there on the mountain. We, you know, we'll, we'll just do it this way. What happened? That, that didn't work out well. We don't worship Christ as we please. We do it according to Scripture. And so Luke is careful to give us uh, orderly account so we can have certainty about the things that we believe. Luke's gospel is about Jesus Christ. Also, he identifies Jesus as Savior, King, Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, uh, eternal Son of God who became flesh and dwelt among us to live a sinless life, to substitute his life for our life, to pay for our death penalty and endure the just wrath of God. Only Christ, only the Son of God could do this. Uh, now, the justice of God, do you think it matters? Because if he lets you go and get away with it, if you have this idea that God is a nice grandfather up there, oh, kids will be kids, you know, that is not grace. That mars his perfect justice. He must be fair. So Hitler dies. Oh, of course Hitler dies. I'm not as bad as Hitler. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're a sinner. You thought it'd be okay to disobey God, the Holy One. You thought that's all right. Well, I don't think I like a God like that. Well, then you don't like the God of the Bible and you like a designer God that people fashion and shape that make, make them comfortable. You have to be careful. See, Jesus was buried three days, and he rose again from the dead for our justification. Only Christ could do this. Muhammad can't do this. Hare Krishna can't do this. He ascended to heaven, where the Bible tells us he intercedes for us, and boy, if he's praying for you, do you suppose his prayers will be answered? He's the son of God praying for you. And he promises to return. And this is what we wait on. Jesus Christ coming in glory, taking names, not messing with anybody. It'll be different when he comes the second time. He'll return to gather us in glorified, resurrected bodies. Mike, you're going to have a new one, you know, amen. You're going to have a new glorified, perfect, sinless body, sinless brain. It's, it's, it's unimaginable, actually. Gabriel testified. He testified that Mary would bear the Son of the Most High. In our, te in our uh, verses and chapters we've gone through, Zechariah, Elizabeth, even John the Baptist 
leapt in the womb of Elizabeth when Jesus, who was in Mary's womb, entered the room. Mary and Joseph testified. Simeon and Anna testified. Now, today, in our text, at age 12, Jesus himself, at age 12, the age of Jake over here. Jake, stand up and look at everybody. There you go. Jesus is 12, like that, right there. He testifies. What does he say? He confesses that he's the son of God. Wow. Quite a claim. And at his baptism, and that'll happen in uh, 18 years from now, the Father and the Holy Spirit will testify as well. But justice must be served. Christ alone, the God-man, no one else can save sinners who deserve justice who deserve the just wrath of God. And that's why it's so important when we read in Scripture that Jesus is the propitiation. It's a word we don't know. That means he took the the just wrath of God that you and I deserve. He cannot look upon sin. Our God is a consuming fire. Do you think of him correctly? Oh, that's not a popular way. You're not going to win friends and influence people talking about God that way, but that's what the Bible teaches us. Why would you need Jesus Christ otherwise? Do as you please then, but that's not the way it is. Thank goodness for Jesus Christ. Luke, a great historian, was also referred to by Paul as the beloved physician. Well, his pediatrician is coming out today. He's observing this 12-year-old boy and how he has grown, how he has uh, flourished, how he, you know, if a child is nursing and isn't growing, there's a problem, isn't there? That's not the case with Jesus. Of the four gospel that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke is the only one who records this incident at age 12. Next, in 18 years, Jesus will be baptized just before his three-year public ministry. He'll be baptized by John the Baptist, which we'll come to in chapter 3. But at age 12, Jesus knows who he is. He's the Son of God. He's truly God, truly man. He's aware of who he is. These so-called, these are referred to by the theologians as the silent years. They're pretty loud with the testimony of Jesus Christ here today. Jesus, truly God, truly man, is the answer for the world today. He's the answer to your future and mine. He's the answer, Christ Jesus. But he leaves us with so many questions. He's not easy to understand because he's God. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Starting with verse 39. And when they had performed, we're speaking of Mary and Joseph, everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to the <coughs> excuse me to their own town of Nazareth and the child grew and became strong filled with wisdom the favor of the lord was upon him now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the passover and when he was 12 they went up according to custom and when the feast was ended as they were returning the boy jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem his parents didn't know it But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? And he said to them, 
Why were you looking for me? Or, excuse me, behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? And they didn't understand the saying that he spoke to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Let's pray. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your word. It, it's so, it so feeds us. We ask that again today it would dwell in the river's edge richly. Help us understand today who Jesus Christ is. Lord, help us that we may worship him in spirit and in truth and not commit idolatry and worship a designer God, a, a formed God, a, a different God. Lord, let us not stray away to another gospel. No, Lord, let us stay true to your holy word. Feed us, fill us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to, just to be extremely safe, I'm, I'm certain I am no longer um, smearing this disease around everybody, but I just don't. I, I'm going to have uh, Ryan do the scriptures for the little ones today. Is that okay? I miss you. I'll do it next week, okay? Just want to make sure. Even though you guys probably gave me the, the COVID-19. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no, nah, I don't care. I couldn't think of anybody better to get it from. All right, look at verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now, in between verse 39 and 40, they would have fled to Egypt to get away from Herod, but, but uh, Luke doesn't feel a need to include it in his gospel. But here, and he gives us the most exhaustive account of what happened, and we're reminded that John, the apostle, said, if everything, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain everything that happened in the three years that they had been together. So we don't get everything, but we sure get a lot from Luke that we don't get from the other Gospels. Here in verse 39, Mary and Joseph obey all the commands of God. They're old covenant parents. And Christ is sinless. Their boy does everything required by law. In verse 40, and the child grew. Imagine that. He's a human being. He's a human being. The child grew and became strong. Filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. At 12, he's 12. He's Jake's age. At 12, he lays claim to this title, son of God, as we will see in verse 49 of our text today. And he does this for the first time. We, this is the only time we hear of him in 30 years. He didn't walk and talk right away. He grew like a human, Okay. And he was a helpless babe. That mean he he would he was wrapped in swaddling cloths. That mean that means he would have messed those swaddling cloths. He he would have to nurse from his mother. He would he was a human, okay? And we're not detracting or taking away from his divinity, his godness, okay? You know what? You know what? I hope by the end of this morning you go, wow, Jesus is something. Jesus is amazing. Je I never thought of Jesus in these ways before. Well, he is, and you ought to love him. You ought to love him. 
So he starts out, helpless babe, he grew as humans do. Here we see he's physically strong and filling with wisdom. Okay? Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge and understanding. And boy, he's getting it. He's getting knowledge and understanding with no, nothing, there's no governor on this thing. There's nothing, control. he's just getting it. 100%. He isn't born a depraved sinner like you and I, like Adam's offspring, like everyone who came from Adam and Eve and Noah and on down. We're all sinners. We're all born sinners. We can't help it. No one does good. No one is righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. Not a single one, including the Virgin Mary. He wisely, Jesus, wisely obeys God 100% of the time, okay? He lo- he's 12, but in these 12 years, he loved the Father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have you? Have you loved God your Father with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Everything that you have, every moment, every second, every day, have you done that? Jesus did for 12 years so far. How would that work out? We can't love God for 30 seconds with sinful brains. We work at, scientists say, whether you can trust them or not, I don't know. But anyways, they say we have about 10% capacity with our brains. We're fallen creatures. They don't work like they're supposed to. And when they do work, they sin. That's what they do constantly. Anybody sin? Ever? Anybody selfish today? Anybody do anything that was sinful yet today? Yeah, I got a lot of hands out there. Some of you don't want to admit it, but you know you sinned. I can tell you you did. You did by not raising your hand. (laughs) But Jesus operates at 100% capacity. What would that be like? I don't know. Do you? What would it be like to not ever sin? So we never rob Jesus of his humanity, nor his divinity. We don't want to rob either nature of who he is. Look at 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. Well, this is, this is remarkable. I mean, this is a feast in remembrance of what? The angel of death passing over through Egypt, over every doorpost that had the shed blood of a perfect uh, a lamb without blemish. They had to find the most perfect lamb that they had, shed its blood, and put it on according to the command of God. And then the angel of death would pass by. What's our greatest enemy? Death. The wages of sin is what? Death. It would require something pretty special to remove this horrible thing. And everything that the Old Covenant Israelites did was only temporary. It it was not perfect. The New Covenant is perfect. And so here you have a feast in remembrance of the angel of death passing over each Hebrew doorpost sprinkled with that blood. Jesus is filling with wisdom right now. It's Passover. He's among the teachers. What do you suppose they're talking about? Passover. This would be big on Jesus' mind right now. Why? Because he has a perfect mind that perfectly loves and perfectly obeys his heavenly father. This is heavy on his mind right now for good reason, and we'll look at that. Verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. Everything's up. Whether you're coming from north, whether you're coming from the east, whether you're coming from the west, whether you're coming from the east or or the south, it doesn't matter. You're going up to Jerusalem. That's how it works, and they're walking. So it's it's something to consider. Uh, It's time for Jesus to be a man. He's 12. In Jewish tradition, you learn a trade at age 12. At age 13, that's the age of accountability. He'd become a bar mitzvah or... 
That means son of commandment. Son of commandment. Well, Jesus is the perfect one. He's responsible now for his own actions, considered a son now, and not a boy. You're a man today. And you know you're at an age of accountability. You know stuff. And now you have to answer for it. Anyway, verse 43, and when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they didn't find him, they returned (coughs) to Jerusalem searching for him. Imagine this. I mean, this is a family nightmare. And some of you have had things like this happen. Where's Emily? Remember when we left you in the restaurant? You must have thought we were the worst parents in the world. We were in Cape Cod. We left her in this restaurant among the pagans. And, you know, and here we are in my big old uh, Chevy van, huge van, you know, because I had a huge family. And, you know, you just didn't even notice, you know, and I'm on these narrow, stupid ancient 17th century Cape Cod roads that you can barely get two cars on. I got two inches on each side of the lane with a Chevy van, full-size Chevy van, and now I got to find a place to turn around. I mean, we're in a panic. I I mean, I'm like, I don't care. I know you're coming, but you're going to stop for this big red van because I'm turning around. I got to go find my daughter. I mean, thankfully, it was only 15 minutes. You know, it was only 15 minutes. Can you imagine a full day passed and Joseph and Mary are just freaking out, poor things. They're beside themselves. It was a four-day journey to Nazareth from, from Jerusalem. It was about 65 miles, probably 69, 70 miles by foot. Um. But the ladies and children would walk in the front, the men in the back. They'd all go in a caravan. You see they have friends and relatives and acquaintances that have all come. There's this big group of people. And Joseph thought, well, he's with Mary. That's the way it always is every time we go to Passover. And Mary's thinking, well, he's 12 now. He's Jake's age. He's with the men. That's where he is. I mean, you can understand how it happened. (coughs) <coughs> they lost a whole day. They had taken care of his every need until today. They're upset, understandably upset. And even though they knew what Gabriel said, their sin-impaired brains can't process this, can't function like their sinless 12-year-old sons can. They panic like sinful parents do. I sinned. I was rude on the highway. I mean, I just pulled out in front of people and I didn't care, you know? I figured, well, if I get in a wreck, fine, I'll keep going and I'll go find my daughter and deal with the consequences later. (laughs) Sinful, panicked, you know. It'll be three terrifying days before they find him. Can you imagine The son of God. We had the son of God in our care and we lost him. (laughs) Verse 46, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. He's humble. We see a sweet-natured, humble boy because he's teachable. He's not a show-off. What's he doing? He's listening and asking questions. He's not blabbing. He's listening. He's a student. He's filling with wisdom. Luke, our pediatrician, is noticing this, and so are you and I. Verse 47, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. He has answers. He's 12, and he has answers, answers they've never thought of. He is the answer for the world. Everybody's amazed, but 
How, here's the question. How did a 12-year-old know all these things and amaze the experts? How can a 12... Okay, well, that's because we're thinking in sinful human terms. Okay? Without thinking, we just say, well, he's God. And God knows everything. We have to be careful not to trip into the heresy of mixing the two natures of Jesus Christ. The fifth century monophysites falsely taught that Jesus was divinely human or humanly divine, essentially saying that he was neither. He was neither true human nor true God. Uh, uh, What are you saying? Yeah, we can't do that. The Bible says otherwise, and it was corrected by the church, the Council of Chalcedon, in 451 A.D., all the leaders got together and they ran, they, they mold this thing over. Twenty years earlier, there was another heresy in 431 A.D. It's called, it was called the Nestorian heresy, which was also condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431 A.D. And then again at this Council of Chalcedon in 451 A.D. But Nestorius, who was a theologian, falsely taught that since Christ had two natures, he must be two persons. So this was a heresy. The council rejected it and affirmed that Jesus in the mystery of the incarnation is truly God and truly man. They wisely set borders, but they didn't try to fully explain the mystery Of Christ. He is, he remains a mystery to us, just like the Trinity remains a mystery. For me, the nature of Christ is more complicated and hard to understand than the Trinity. How can you be one person, or one God and three persons in, in complete unity? And how can you be two natures, one person? It's 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 complicated. But we don't want to go outside those borders. They wisely set borders. They didn't try to explain it. They said, according to the Bible, Jesus is truly human and truly divine, having two natures, perfectly united, listen, without mixture. Here there are four goalposts that they set. Without mixture, confusion, separation, or division. Those are the rules. You don't go beyond those those borders, okay? So to worship Christ, we never mix, confuse, separate, or divide his natures. So we don't just say that Jesus is wise here as a 12-year-old in the temple because he's God and rob him of his sinless humanity. Of course he knows everything is God. But he's also a perfect human being, and we, we haven't seen that since uh, Adam, and then he blew it with uh, Lucifer. Verse 48, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. What are you doing with those guys? And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. They're stressed out. Knowing what they knew that he was the Christ, by the witness of angels, cousins, shepherds, wise men, Simeon, Anna, they were reminded over and over of what the deal was. They did all they could to keep the law and raise Christ in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're uh, they're understandably frustrated. They're understandably Uh, stressed out. Why did you do this? But Mary should never accuse the sinless son of God. Well, what was their their parents? I mean, I cannot totally understand. Yeah, you're sympathizing with sin. You don't accuse the sinless son of God. We never judge God because he allows events in our lives that stress us out. Mike's not allowed to get mad at God because he was sick for three months. Christians don't do that. 
Well, I can understand. Well, what are you talking about? Mary doubted God and willfully sinned against the Son of God. So much for Mary the Virgin's perfection here. We get why. We understand why she was frustrated. We sympathize with her as sinners, but it's no excuse. The Son of God is innocent. Whose side are you going to take? Are you going to take Mary's side or Jesus' side? I'm taking Jesus' side. I hope you join me. And he said to them, verse 49, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must, I must, everybody say it, I must, I must be in my father's house. By the way, side note, if Jesus must be in his father's house, shouldn't you and I? Isn't that where we should be? Are we followers of Jesus Christ? At 12, Jesus knows who he is. Look at this. If it's his father's house, who's the son? What is he saying? He's confessing that he's the son of God. This goes over everybody's heads. <clears throat> it's blasphemy to Jewish leaders who'd eventually kill him for this. For claiming equality with God. That's what he was saying. I, I, we have much to, to cover here today. <coughs> but that's exactly what it meant in the Jewish culture, uh, clearly. And I don't have time to go into why, but just trust me on that, okay? Here it went over their heads. He's not rebelling. He's not being disrespectful. He's reminding Joseph and Mary that they are his temporary guardians. And Oh, parents, understand, these children, these children are temporary. It, it, you're, the guard, you're a steward over these children. They're not yours. They're, they're the Lord's, and you should see them in that way. And he's reminding them, hey, I'm not of your house. I'm of my father's house, and I must do my father's will. He said that over and over. I must do my will or my father's will above over and above yours. He'll patiently submit to them for the next 18 years. In 21 years, exactly. Mark this, he's 12. 21 years exactly from this Passover date, 21 year, 21 Passover festivals later. He'll ask his heavenly father to let the cup of death pass. No human wants to be tortured to death because he's human. Yet what does he say? He submits to his heavenly father and he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. You guys pay attention to the end because I'm going to help you understand why this matters. There's answers. You know when you talk to somebody that kind of beat around the bush for a while, you know? Uh, but, but really when they want to get to it, it, it's at the end of what, if you listen to people and what they have to say, usually what they want to really say comes at the end. So you always want to be careful to pay attention to the very end and not let your mind wander. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was a sinless human being. And the eternal son of God who obeys his father perfectly. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was one in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. In Hebrews 7.26 he, he is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5.21 he knew no sin. Pilate's wife told her husband have nothing to do with that just man. Pilate himself said, I find no fault with him. The thief hanging on the cross said, this man has done nothing wrong. The centurion guarding the cross when it went dark and it, and it rent 
uh, in the temple and there was an earthquake, he said, surely, certainly, this was a righteous man in Luke 23, 47. Demons knew. The demons knew he was sinless and called him the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of God. Even Satan knew. Satan knew and he did everything in his power to get him to sin. 40 days, 40 nights. Jesus batted him off like a fly. But beyond being obedient to the moral and ceremonial laws, Jesus was commanded to lay down his life willingly and take it again. This command, Jesus said, I have received from my father in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. At 12, a sweet-natured Jesus is all about his father's business, amazed, amazing everyone who heard him. His questions, his answers were profound. They'd never heard any such thing. Why? Because he's God? I don't want to rob him of his divinity at all. But we dare not rob him of his humanity. He's a 12-year-old perfect human being. And also the eternal son of God who created all that we see. He'll be the Passover lamb. This is on his mind. 12 years old, he knows who he is. And he knows he's got to die. No human wants to be tortured. He'll be the Passover lamb to be slain once for all. His shed blood will deal with death forever. Only Jesus Christ, truly human, truly divine, can endure the just wrath of God. And it's, it's what you and I deserve, every, every single one of us in this room. Do you think you could have an excuse from your mama? Well, here, God, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry, you know. No, you're done for. Without truly God and truly man, you're done for. There's nothing you can do. You can't make up for it yourself. God's justice must be protected. God is fair all the time. You sinned. You deserve death. That's fair. Only Jesus, truly human, truly divine, can save sinners. That's why it's important, friends. Verse 50, and they didn't understand the saying that he spoke to them. I must be in my father's house. They didn't get it. He's patient. At his father's request, he'll be the fat Passover lamb, slain to take away the sins of all who believe. Abraham predicted this to his son Isaac. That was a type. That was a picture of what was to come. Abraham offering his son. And Isaac saying, what are you doing? Where's the, where's the lamb? God will provide a lamb, and he certainly does. He provides his one and only son. Verse 51. <coughs> and he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. He was never rebellious, okay? Mary would see her son suffer and die, but she didn't fully comprehend what, what Jesus did for his heavenly father. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. It says earlier, as she pondered these things in her heart, can you imagine giving birth to the son of God and, and all these things happening? It just more than a person can imagine. And Jesus increased. We see this. So, so now he was with these teachers. He's considering Passover. And he increased in wisdom. Imagine what a brain at 100% capacity is learning and gathering at this point. A sinless human brain can gain and retain great knowledge. Uh, what does the Bible say? Those who seek me, find me if they seek me with all their heart. You think Jesus did? Yes, he did with all his heart. So he gained all sorts of understanding of his heavenly father and what was required of him. Do you do that? I don't have time. Oh, we're so sinful. 
We're so lazy. We're pathetic. But Jesus walked in perfect fellowship with his father, and he increased not only in wisdom, what does it say? In stature. That means he grew physically because he's truly human. I mean, if you see him, if you would have been a disciple or somebody that saw him, he had flesh and blood. He grew uh, as a human, even in the brain. And then he grew with favor with God and man. He pleased God. The Heavenly Father would testify at his baptism, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The Heavenly Father is fully pleased with Jesus at age 30. At age 33, he will be crucified. And the scholars loved him. He had favor with man. His mom and dad loved him. They scoured Jerusalem for three days to find him. The so-called silent years are loud to those with ears to hear. Jesus testifies to be the son of God. This is how wise he's become in 12 years. He didn't say, I'm the son of God at birth. He didn't come out of his mom's womb talking and walking and, well, he's the son of God. He should have, no, he's a human. But this will drive the Jewish leaders to crucify him. But like a lamb to the slaughter, he obeys his father who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He's like, I, have you ever seen a, a, a lamb? I think I've told this story before. I mean, we were in Romania doing ministry, and uh, it was Passover time, and it was Easter. And literally in the market, they had lambs that you could buy. Uh, and there they stood. They had, you know, tied to a post. And if you come up and bought it, they'd grab it. It was, it was brutal. I mean, they were just such sweet little innocent little lambs. They'd grab them, slit their throat, blood everywhere, gushing everywhere. Here you go. Take your lamb home. And yeah, <laughs> that's the way it was. And Christ was a lamb to the slaughter, a perfect lamb. Jesus, fully God, fully man. Yet we dare not mix, confuse, separate, or divide these two natures of Jesus. Who does? The Mormons do. If you, if you leave those goalposts that I described just now, uh, well, that's what the Mormons do. You're going to be a heretic if you do. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. That's what Islam does. They don't understand the Son of God. Be careful. What I've attempted to do today is not rob Jesus of his humanity, nor rob him of of his divinity. Jesus is the son of God, made flesh, two natures in one person. So why is Jesus being truly God and truly man so important? How am I supposed to apply this to my life today? Well, number one, you don't want to be an idolater. You don't want to shape, you don't want to be lazy about this. You want to grow up. You don't want to remain a child. We want to leave the elementary teachings and move on and worship God in spirit and in truth. So we go to the Heidelberg Catechism. It's helpful to us this morning. Listen. I, listen at the end. Remember, I'm going to give you some answers. They ask in question 15 of the Catechism, what kind of a mediator and redeemer then must we seek? Listen. Listen. One who is true and righteous man, and yet more powerful than all creatures. That is, one who is also true God. Question 16 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Listen. Why must he be a true and righteous man? Listen. Because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which has sinned should make satisfaction for sin. But one who is himself a sinner cannot satisfy for others. That's why you can't make up for your mistakes. You can't do it. You need Jesus. 
Question 17, why must he also be true God? All God, all human, all God, two natures. Do I get it? Do I fully comprehend it? No, I don't. But why must he also be true God? That by the power of his Godhead, now think about this, he might bear in his manhood the burden of God's wrath. You and I'd be consumed in his presence. That's why they would tie a rope to the priest when he went into the Holy of Holies so that he wouldn't be. And if he was consumed and went, went in inappropriately without cleansing himself and doing all the things that he needed to do, they'd tie a rope and then they'd pull his body out because they didn't want to go in there. So that by the power of his Godhead, he might bear in his manhood the burden of God's wrath and so obtain for and restore to us righteousness and life. You need to be perfect. I need to be perfect. The only way that comes is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Everybody say it. Jesus Christ. That's what I need. That's what you need. But who now is the mediator who in one person is true God and also a true and righteous man? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who was freely given unto us for complete redemption and righteousness. So my question to you this morning is, do you place your faith in this Jesus of the Bible? Is this the Jesus you trust? If so, you're saved. If you have trusted him with your life, if when you leave here, you're not just going to ignore him and, you know, but you literally want to do your best to pursue him, if that's who you are, you're saved. You trust him. If not, you'll perish and you won't have everlasting life. And I do you no good by telling you you're okay. This is the Jesus Christ we worship. We believe in him and we join our brother and sisters from the centuries, one faith. It's never changed. It's all the same. Would you bow your heads with me? Oh, God, thank you for these answers. Uh, Lord, we don't fully understand how it is you are both truly God and truly man, and that's okay. Our minds are limited. I pray that you would dwell in our people richly, God, that you would move move things in their lives, that they wouldn't remain the same. Lord, so many people go to church every Sunday, but they've never trusted you. They've never trusted you. Lord, let, let not one soul in this building in the hearing of my words this morning, be lost. Lord, may they place their faith and trust in you immediately. Immediately, Lord. Give them faith to believe. God, save their souls. And Lord, let them not be lazy about this. And God, let us pursue you with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, just like Jesus did. God, we ask these things by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand? I suppose I went long. Did I go long? A little bit, a little bit. Did you notice? Was it, did I go too long? We're okay? You're going to come back next week? Okay. I hope you do. Let's sing glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen, amen. That's who we are. He's gonna return. He's gonna resurrect our nasty bodies and make us perfect, glorified bodies. Wouldn't that be wonderful? He's coming soon. He's coming soon, all right. Mm, Glory.
Go in God's peace. May the blessing of Christ be upon you all. I love you. <coughs> Ryan, would you mind doing the scriptures? And maybe Vogi. Hey, let's give Vogi a big hand. He did such a good job last week delivering the word of God. And you too, Ryan. You did great. <laughs>